Sir Richard Eyre is here from 1988 to 1997. He served as the artistic director for the Royal National Theater. His tenure there was hailed as the Golden Age. Since then, he has had success on Broadway with Amy's View and The Crucible, also in film directing Judy Dench and Kate Winslet in Iris. His latest play, Vincent in Brixton, marks his first trip back to the National Theater since leaving there. It was written by Nicholas Wright. The work follows the early years of Vincent van Gogh living in London and falling in love with an older woman. Let me tell you something. For months and months, I thought about your daughter. And I even can't remember what she looks like. All I can see is you. Her hair in yours and her eyes. Where are you going? Mr. Vincent, have you any idea how old I am? After a successful run in London, the play has now transferred to Broadway. I'm pleased to welcome Richard Eyre back to this table. Welcome. Thank you. Now, how, where does this come from, Vincent? I mean, I realize Nicholas Wright wrote it, but I mean, what was so intriguing about this idea that you and he, with all your talent, decided that this is what we wanted to do? It comes from a very, very small, quirky anecdote, which is the anecdote that uh, <laughs> Vincent, the, the, the person I've come to know, is called Van Gogh. Oh, yeah, right. Uh, you call Van Gogh, we call Van Gogh. I know you do, I know. Uh, and in the play, you learn that his real name, which he says nobody can pronounce, is Van Gogh. Van Gogh. Uh, yes. But let's stick with Van Gogh. Right, right. Uh, it, he lived in London uh, in 1873 in a rather obscure and bleak suburb. I guess the, the New York equivalent would be Vincent in the Bronx. Right. And he, it's known... It's a borough, not a it, it, it's suburb. A, yeah. <laughs> uh, and it, it, he wrote a number of letters home. A lot of those letters uh, from this period are missing. But what you can infer from the existing letters is that he had an unfortunate love affair and was very, very distraught and eventually um, had a kind of nervous breakdown and went back later to, to work in England as a preacher. In the play... He does have an unfortunate love affair. He chooses to live in the house that uh, he lives in because he sees this lovely young girl in the street and follows her in. He sees a sign called Room to Let. Falls in love with the, the daughter impulsively and then falls in love with the mother who is some 25 right. years older. I repeat my question because I want to get at yeah. this idea. Uh, are you just using this story because Van Gogh Van Gogh, or whatever you want to say. I mean, you, there is a difference in Van Gogh. It's just easy for American ears. Because it gives you the capacity to tell some important story through That's the exactly crucible it. of that. That's exactly it. It's not, it's not a play. It's not a biographical play. Right. And, and nobody can dispute the, the facts as presented in the play. Nobody can say they are true or nobody can say they aren't true. Right. The play is really about depression, creativity, and sex. Uh, which, uh, <laughs> which go together? Which is, all, all good plays are about those things. Yeah, depression, creativity, and sex. Yes. Uh, but help me more understand in terms because I love the idea of you coming together. You know, I mean, did 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 Nick have the idea and say he, he had the idea? And I guess about um, two and a half years ago, we were on a long car journey, and he he claimed to know the direction where we were going. Of course, it turned out he didn't. <laughs> but uh, so he was telling me about what he was writing. Yes. And he just had an idea to write about, really, I think, initially to write about depression, discovered this story about the young Van Gogh. And out of that, that was the kind of the kernel of the play, this, this strange anecdote. He wrote a draft of the play. I read it. I made some suggestions. And at the time, I was, I'd been working in film. I'd been doing the film of Iris. Yeah. And, and I'd written the screenplay of that and had to submit to eight different executive producers who all had different <laughs> ideas of how to make the, the screenplay yeah. better. And I said to Nick, let's go through a similar process. He, he went white. He said, what do you mean? I said, look, <laughs> most plays are just put on. Yeah. Let's actually examine every line of this play. Let's do a uh, work with some actors. We, we spent, uh, did a two-week workshop. He was wonderfully receptive and positive about it. He took in everything and then rewrote it, and, and what we have is what he came up with. Now, this posits the notion that you believe the process you went through in getting a screenplay for Iris is valuable and helpful. 
Yes, I know that a number of people will, <laughs> will, will blanch at the idea yes. that it could be helpful. I actually, I took a decision early on in the process, not with to, Iris, with Iris right. not to recoil whatever anybody said, uh, because I thought, actually, these are people who, however crass some of the ideas may, but they all have a vested interest in wanting the thing to be improved. So I would listen on the principle that if they talk for 20 minutes, at least one minute is going to contain an idea <laughs> which I can use. <laughs> so it, it, it was actually quite opportunistic. Mm -hmm. And then I thought, this is not the worst process in the world. It's not pe if you believe people are working in good faith, it's not as if they say, can you do that? Can you make the ending happy? Mm -hmm. Can you make a good part for, for Julia Roberts? They're actually trying to make the thing itself better in its own terms. And, and different writers do different things better. In other words, some do this better, some do sure. better, some do obviously. And, and some aren't great rewriters. Yeah. A lot of writers are, you know, great writers are not great rewriters. And some people can only rewrite, not create. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and in the theatre, there's a tradition, which I think is an honourable tradition, that you don't mess around with the writer. The, the writer writes the play, the play exists, it, and it, it's a sacrosanct entity that isn't interfered with. Well, I would say that a, a, a dialectic is, you know, a, a debate about how to make it better is in everybody's interest. Do you care about historical accuracy here? I mean, are we convinced that Vincent, uh, you know, had this affair with Ursula? No, we're not convinced, but we're not convinced it didn't happen. There is absolutely so, nothing. <laughs> what we know is that he, in a letter he wrote home, he writes glowingly of, um, of the mother of Ursula Loyer, this 45-year-old woman. I mean, quite, in, in an exaggerated form, he worshipped her. Um, so we know that. We know that the family thought that he'd fallen in love. They thought with the daughter. And we know that he left under strange circumstances. So um, you can put it together, and I don't, you can't dispute the story that's told in the play. But you can't prove it. Okay. What is the most important? You said that this is about depression and sex. And creativity. And creativity. Now, my point is, that leads to my question. What's the most important thing you know? You're 59 years old, right? Yeah. What, is, what have you learned about creativity? What do you know about creativity? What's the most, you know, give us, if you had to do a last lecture and someone said, you know, Richard, tell me about creativity. Where does it come from? Who has it? Who doesn't have it? How do you... Can, can you learn it? I think everybody has it, uh, and, and it's a question of how you release it. Um, everybody has some, by definition, some original perception about the world. That's, that's on one hand. On the other hand, there's, there's a talent that is unquestionably God-given. There are some people who have it, and they have it from birth, and that's true of remarkable actors, of remarkable musicians and mm. poets and, sure. and painters sure. and you can't legislate for that you can't legislate where it emerges all you can do is be prepared for it and encourage it and nurture it and, and celebrate and it. and hope it has an opportunity to express itself and you're reinforced so that it grows yeah and and of course van gogh's example is one that uh, that's, it's a particularly melancholy one because he he didn't apart from theo have those people who nurtured his talent this is an old question but do you think it has to come out of pain i think there there is i, I can't imagine a totally happy artist <laughs> richard ayers always great to see you thank you for joining us see you next time